Good morning, everybody. Good day, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are around the globe. I would like to very warmly welcome you to this webinar, which is um, attracting people from really every continent. And we want to focus on the role that women leaders play and will play in reshaping the world and creating a new normal. Because as little as a few months ago, the circumstances that we have today were really unthinkable and considered improbable. We were supposed to be in New York, we as WPL, for the summit that we have every year in the United Nations. But COVID-19 has changed the world dramatically for now two or more months and who knows for how long still to go. And we only begin to see what the effects are and even less understand that's still a pile of work ahead of us. Everybody surely is waiting for the moment when we can all go back to normal, but we shouldn't really go back to the pre-COVID-19 normal because that is a normal where equality between women and men is an exception. It's a normal where fundamental human rights are not respected. Just think of Black Lives Matter or the Me Too movement. Helen Keller once said, although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. And this pandemic offers an unprecedented opportunity, meaning the opportunity to create a new normal, to overcome the normal that we had before. Women, we have all seen that. Women have been at the forefront when it comes to suffering from this pandemic in health, in education, in violence, also economically. But they also have been at the forefront with their courage, with their leadership and with their compassion. And women as a majority of the healthcare workforce, they act as a strong foundation for a comprehensive healthcare solution. And women leaders, women parliamentarians, women politicians, they have been playing key roles. Yet, they're still missing in the decision-making, in the task forces, in the response groups, and also in the group of experts that were asked for advice by leaders. The crisis management really had a male face. So today, here in this webinar, we're discussing with female outstanding leaders from around the globe, their views, their solutions, their suggestions to ensure that the new normal that we strive for will be one where being a man or a woman will not influence the role that you will play in society. 2020, this year, was said to be an exceptionally important year for women, for women's leadership. It marks the 25th anniversary of the so-called Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. This important document supplied a new framework for everybody in the world on what equality between women and men should be like. And it was a really important milestone which disrupts the old narrative of what is leadership. And so our WPL summit was supposed to be today in New York, in the United Nations, to mark that milestone. So let's take this opportunity here to discuss female leaders shaping the world of the future, building a new normal. And I'm absolutely thrilled and happy and proud and excited that we have the most stellar lineup that one can think of for this kind of discussion. I'd briefly like to introduce them and then hand over to Helen Clark, who will chair this webinar, because she is the chair of the board of WPL. She was the prime minister of New Zealand from 1999 to 2008. Then she was the administrator of the UNDP for eight years, 2009, 2017. She's the chair of this webinar and she resides in so many and works in so many boards and organizations that it would take up the time of this whole set webinar to list them all. So I leave it at these, at these milestones um, in your career, Helen. Then I'm also very happy to welcome Jewel Howard Taylor, who is the Vice President of Liberia, the President of the Senate of Liberia, and uh, 
also sharing with, with us maybe some insights on, um, on Ebola and the lessons learned from that. Marie-Louise colero Preca, of course, the president of Malta from 2014 to 2019, today president of Eurochild, is, uh, is with us. Nuyati Ali Asega, who's the vice chairman of the Democratic Party of Indonesia, and again, also chairing a lot of other important um, organizations, including the Geneva Council for International Affairs and Development. Rosalia Arteaga, president of Ecuador, will join us. And also, of course, last but not least, Hanna Birna Christian Stottir from Iceland, who is the senior advisor on women's leadership at UN Women and the chair of the board of the Reykjavik Global Forum. So, Helen, over to you. And I'm really happy that so many people from around the globe are joining this webinar. Thank you, Silvana. And greetings, fellow panelists, and greetings to those who have tuned in from around the world to this digital summit, uh, taking place at a time when we hoped we'd be uh, about to be in New York uh, for the WPL uh, meeting, which had been arranged there. But uh, obviously, New York like so many places around our world, has been through a very distressing period uh, with the pandemic, many lives lost, huge uh, injury, disruption to society, economy, and uh, it's not a place you go for a summit uh, at, at the moment. So here we are online and uh, wanting to engage with those who are very interested in the role of women's leadership uh, in addressing uh, how we move forward from uh, the, the pandemic and, and how we help shape a new normal, not just see a, a rush back to business as usual, which as Silvana has said, uh, wasn't actually always that nice in any case. So uh, some opening points from me. Uh, firstly, I want to record uh, that women leaders on average have done rather well in managing the pandemic whether we're talking Hannah's uh, country, Iceland, my own, New Zealand, whether we're talking uh, the Nordic countries uh, with women leaders, uh, uh, Angela Merkel in, in Germany, uh, the women have been given a lot of credit for evidence-based responses, for empathy with people, for consulting, for listening, for taking advice, and for uh, putting health and human security to the fore. And I think all of us who champion women's leadership, that, that's exactly what we want to see women leaders doing. And that's why we need many more women leaders than we have in our world today. Uh, now, on the, the pandemic and how it's affected women and how we go forward, we, we have to recognize the adverse effects on women uh, so that that is factored in to shaping a new normal. And I'd just like to, to focus on three areas where women have been particularly severely impacted. The first, of course, is that health services have not been as accessible to many during the pandemic. Uh, and let me specify in particular, sexual and reproductive health services, because there are places where these have not been deemed to be essential services. So what's the consequence of that? Women can't get the contraception they want. There will be unintended uh, uh, pregnancies. Uh, if they can't access a range of services, they may give birth unattended. They may not survive that experience. They may not get the care and support they need uh, in pregnancy. So in the sexual and reproductive health area, there are some, some real issues. Uh, there's been an estimate uh, made by others that says 47 million women could well have lost contraceptive access uh, through uh, this, this period. Now, secondly, when we're locked down in our homes, there is, of course, the potential for more gender-based violence, a scourge on all our society. No one has solved this, managed to eliminate this. And it has, again, been estimated that these lockdowns, women trapped in homes with partners who are violent, uh, there may be an extra 31 million cases of gender-based violence. That is horrific and, and, and clearly uh, deeply uh, distressing uh, to us all. The third impact has, of course, been on livelihoods. Women, uh, on average, are poorer than men, have more precarious uh, livelihoods. Uh, 
Four billion people in our world, men, women, and children, have no social protection at all. So if you are a woman who is in any case poorer and in a more precarious position, and there's no social protection, and you're trying to put food on the table for the family, and you have the responsibility for children and older relatives and relatives with other needs, things get pretty tough. So those are three sets of impacts. Now, shaping the, the new normal, I think we have to recognize that our world is facing this, this range of simultaneous crises. You could call it a syndemic. We have the crisis, uh, which is the conflict raging in a number of countries, which has led to the largest number ever of displaced people, refugees, internally displaced uh, ever in, in our world. We have inequality that perpetuates inequality on many dimensions. The one we focus on most in women political leaders is obviously the, the gender inequality. We have the challenge of climate change, which exacerbates existing vulnerabilities. And again, uh, women uh, tend to be disproportionately impacted. We have the biodiversity crisis. And then we have not only this pandemic, but ongoing pandemic risks. And let's be clear, this case of COVID-19 is the sixth time in 17 years that the World Health Organization has declared a public health emergency of international concern. And five of those six cases were zoonotic diseases, animal to human uh, transfer uh, like COVID-19. So th this is going to, to keep happening. We have to be better prepared. We have to shape societies that can deal with these things decisively. Uh, so I think that if we draw from where the impact has been adverse, would we not want women leaders to be emphasizing the critical importance of social protection? Societies need basic social protection so that when there's a shock, people don't see their lives just, just, just crumble uh, before them. Universal health coverage with resilient health systems so that systems don't just stop uh, when there's a crisis like a, a pandemic. We have to take into account what have been clear failings in responses to this pandemic and say, we want those, those fixed. Uh, I think also uh, that for women political leaders, it will be important at, at the country level to be demanding reviews of how the pandemic was handled, identify the specifics in each country's uh, situation, uh, so that feeding into the national debate as countries try to reset, it, you ask those questions. What services fell over? How could we do better? How could we support people better next time? How could we be better uh, uh, prepared for this? And I think at the, the global level, the voices of the women political leaders calling for full and frank international reviews, which should raise the issue of the lack of solidarity, because there's been precious little international solidarity, uh, and also, uh, you know, we would want women leaders to be saying, let's not deal with this in isolation. We have a syndemic of crises. We want our world collectively to step up on climate change, on biodiversity, on inequality, on women's leadership, on resolving conflict, because the old normal wasn't great. The new normal we could shape could be better. So those are the thoughts that uh, came to my mind in, in uh, starting off uh, our summit tonight. Now, uh, I don't uh, yet see our colleague from uh, Liberia uh, online with us. So I'm going to wait till I do before introducing her. But meantime, ready to roll is our friend, the former president of Malta, Marie-Louise Colero Trejka. Uh, president for five years from 2014 to 2019 and a passionate fighter for women, gender equality and everything that matters to women. Marie-Louise, please come in. Thank you, Helen. I'm truly pleased to be with you and uh, so many other women um, across the globe participating in this uh, WPL uh, Digital Summit today. COVID-19 undoubtedly presented us with not just a global challenge, but has created a whole process of challenges. One challenge leading to the next. Challenges which certainly highlighted the harsh reality 
of social inequalities that exist globally and a non-resilient global economy. It is evident that the effects of COVID-19 pandemic has compounded the hardships of those with already underlying social constraints. Poverty, homelessness, lack of income, education, formal employment, health and mental health. All these became even more visible and unfortunately further exasperated by isolation, fear, uncertainty and insecurity. This crisis has shown us that we lack resilience, that we lack solidarity, that even though as an international community, we have been committed for over 70 years to human rights and to five years to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, inequalities still persist in a big way. So we must say that now is the time, now is the opportunity to address existing inequalities. This is the only right thing to do for human dignity and for the effectiveness of our universal human rights. But it is also the only way to ensure that the eventual economic recovery will effectively reduce the poverty brought on by COVID-19. We cannot afford to run the risk of reinforcing and deepening the social divide. And this can only be done after addressing the immediate needs of the most vulnerable in order to promote inclusive and equitable processes of economic recovery. We need to turn this monstrous scourge of COVID-19 into an opportunity, which means that we need to address the social inequalities once and for all. Addressing inequalities should give meaning to the new normal, where no one is truly left behind, where everyone has equal access to health, education, adequate income, healthy food and healthy lives. Therefore, I would like to touch upon the four most important areas that need attention, mainly education, healthcare, social protection, and gender equality. And I'll start with education. I would like to refer to the, to the European Union Wellbeing and Economic Growth Report of 2019, which recommends a number of important steps to ensure that education is effectively accessible to all. This report em emphasizes the need for encouraging higher attendance at pre-primary level, the need for giving greater autonomy to schools and universities, the need to lowering student to teacher ratios, the need to lessening the differences between academic and vocational education, and the need to lowering barriers for funding students at tertiary level. What about health? In healthcare, we need to keep in mind that there needs to be a greater focus on investing in health. We are seeing that COVID-19 has exposed this matter in a big way in many countries. Investing in healthcare is an investment in the well-being of our societies. Healthcare enhances social protection and also helps in reducing poverty associated with ill health. Investing in health, in healthcare, also means that we are investing in increased happiness and life satisfaction. Let me give an example in economic terms. What healthcare really can, can be so effective? Globally, 550,000 people of working age die prematurely every year. And this, this figure, and I must correct myself, it's not globally, it's in the European Union alone. 550,000 people of working age die prematurely every year. This is due to non-communicable diseases. Diseases which are actually preventable. In economic terms, this means that 3.4 million life years are lost and 115 billion euros in economic potential lost annually. Furthermore, a study of the 
36 OECD countries, the uh, EU 28 and G20 countries, finds that population-wide communication strategies and policy interventions to improve diet and physical activity have the potential to help save up to 58 billion on total health budgets by 2050. As fellow leaders, we should therefore encourage our governments and our authorities to ensure access to high quality healthcare. High quality healthcare, which must be accessible to all of our populations. To prioritize prevention and health promoting measures and high levels of health protection as an essential investment. To measure the improvement of mental health, such as developing more systematic diagnostic and support programs, including in schools, during pregnancy, and during perinatal periods. And to promote non-discrimination at work and reducing stress in the workplace. I turn now to social protection. Another important OECD research confirms that more inclusive social protection is associated with higher gross domestic product growth, GDP growth, while higher income inequality puts a break on economic performance. Research shows that social protection contributes to increase socioeconomic resilience and promotes investment in physical and human capital, as well as higher economic growth. With regards to gender equality, we all know that gender equality benefits societies and economies in many ways. In fact, the European Union estimates that improving gender equality could lead to an increase in total GDP of up to 9.6% by 2050. We must be clear that gender equality is intrinsically linked with family-friendly policies that in turn helps both men and women to achieve a better work-life balance and greater well-being. Therefore, we need policies that reconcile work and family life, notably through quality early education and care services to allow women to develop their careers and full potential and in turn also eliminate poverty. Through the few evidence-based examples which I mentioned, it is clear that inequalities should be a key concern and addressing them a top priority for our policymakers. To address inequalities, we definitely need a coherent and an integrated approach to socioeconomic policies across the whole of government, together with the private sector, civil society organizations, and all stakeholders in our societies. I would like once again to quote an OECD report, which emphasizes that creating an economy of well-being is not just a mission for governments. The private sector can also contribute to this objective in different ways. Establishing effective public-private partnerships for promoting well-being and mobilizing private finance for social impact investment can constitute an innovative way of meeting financing challenges. Unquote. My contribution to today's Women Political Leaders Global Digital Summit is meant to be for some food for thought on how we can build a new normal by the lessons learned during this COVID-19 period. I sincerely believe that the key task underlying in rebuilding our societies is to address inequalities. This is fundamental to rebuilding our economies and our well-being as one human family. Women in all this are crucial. We need to be courageous. We need to challenge the norms. We cannot be complacent. We cannot afford to be complacent. Everything has changed. That's why it is even more crucial now to work together. Women cannot be absent from this equation. Women leaders must lead our nations together with men. We have evidence and proof that women leaders are effective. We could see it clearly during this pandemic 
countries which had very effective responses, as Helen has mentioned before, to the pandemic, are all led by women, including Germany, New Zealand, Iceland, and Finland. Research shows that the so-called soft skills that women possess, like empathy, communication, and listening skills, are necessary for effective leadership and serve women well when in management positions. Likewise, research has proven that women are more emotionally intelligent and more directed towards the common good. Alice Igley, a former professor of psychology at Northwestern University, says that having a sense of common good is the key driver of women leaders to be at the front during a crisis. Igley further confirms that there is scientific evidence suggested that women are more compassionate, empathic, and caring, which are very important traits for leadership. As an example, the whole world could notice New Zealand's Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern. Her clear, consistent, and empathic messages on Instagram, which have been acclaimed as an, an example of good leadership. Another major gender difference among leaders identified by Igli is the tendency for women to be more participative and collaborative, traits that are particularly valuable when tackling public health crisis. I strongly believe that with all the ingrained skills that women possess, they can be ideal agents of change, particularly in tackling inequalities successfully. I believe leaders can walk the talk, women leaders can walk the talk. Moving beyond the rhetoric, women leaders are doers. Finally, let me take this opportunity to encourage every one of us as women leaders to encourage other women to work together so that we will truly turn the COVID-19 challenge into an opportunity for a better world. Let's work together to address inequalities and ascribe inequalities to history. Let's ensure that the new normal is one where we are all truly equal. I truly thank women political leaders for taking this initiative to bring so many women leaders across the world together today, even though being physically together is much better than being remotely um, together. But still, technology has served, served us well. Thank you, women, women political leaders. Thank you, Marie Louise, for your really encouraging and affirmative words around women's leadership now and, and going forward, and also for identifying so clearly areas of policy which you believe women leaders could be particularly effective in, in helping shape going forward. We're now going to uh, move around the world from Malta uh, to Indonesia. And uh, we have uh, with us online, uh, Nurhayati uh, Ali Asagaf. Nurhayati is a former Indonesian parliamentarian and continues as vice chairwoman of the Democratic Party of Indonesia. And uh, she is also going to talk about the role of women leaders in, in shaping a policy in a range of areas. So Nur Hayati, come off mute and come in and uh, please speak to our global audience. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Hannah, for the nice introduction. Hello, everybody. Hello, all the panelists, the president, also Hannah, and Mary Louise and Helen Clark itself. So uh, I'm here to talk about the roles of women political leaders in shaping policy for gender justice and equality towards new normal. First of all, please allow me to convey our really great appreciation to the WPL for having this very momentum webinar summit with the crucial topic uh, for female leaders shaping new words, uh, future of the world with the new normal. I mean that uh, we have been concerned about this COVID-19 since the epidemic and since the CCTV of uh, China, Wuhan, China announced that there is a, a viral a phenomena which is uh, caused the COVID. And also the WHO announcement about on the 
January 12th. And then, uh, so everybody's uh, become very uh, shocked with this situation, as uh, Mary mentioned before. And of course, some countries make their own policy. Some countries uh, have a full lockdown and some countries adjust with the uh, partial lockdown, which is uh, social distancing. And, and then we have the work from home, which uh, concerning more women because work from home and especially education online, uh, the women has more work than others. I mean that because of the nurture that women take good care of everybody. So, and we know that uh, since then, this uh, lockdown, full lockdown and partial lockdown or social distancing, of course, depend on the need of the countries for the economic growth, for their economic growth, for their social lives, and then also for the uh, healthcare system. This is really something that we should uh, work, especially that woman political leader. Next, please. Next. We know that, sorry. 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 Go back to the, before, please. Thank you. Discrimination against women is built into legal system around the world. Even though that women occupied more than half of world population, but discrimination against women are still there. This is the fact and we cannot deny. So women political leaders hold the power to urge legislation repairing inequalities and injustice targeting women. Our uh, first panelist, Mary Louise has mentioned this, and then we know that uh, this is what we should do. Next, please. Next, three key roles of, no, sorry, before, before, sorry, uh, others after this, sorry, no, next, sorry, the third one, third one, sorry, yes, thank you. Three key roles of women political leaders to promote gender equality and justice. First, champion in placing women decision-making position in political institution. We know that when we, uh, the leaders has, uh, has the power to put, uh, to influence the decision-making. So when we are there, we can hold up, we can uplift uh, other women to be in political uh, leaders as the decision making. We in Indonesia has law number two, 2008, which says that uh, quota 30% for women to sit in the political party in the structure. But we make sure, the leaders make sure that not only fulfill the quota, but they should have their post strategic position that they can influence the decision making policy, of course. Also, the Law number 10, 2008, which says that in the general election that woman has quota 30%. But as a leader, we make sure not only against to fulfill the quota, but to win the election. So women should win uh, 30%. We sh should make sure that women win the election and sit there in the house and then can influence the pop, uh, policy of the house, of course. And number two, streamline gender justice initiative amongst all national institutions. Of course, like Mary uh, become the, uh, was the president of Malta, she is the president of Malta, and also uh, Helen Clark. That she, they do a lot of things, of course, Hannah to uh, everybody here. They can do many things because when we are in the government, so we make sure to streamline gender justice initiative amongst all national institutions. And third, Number three is placing a strong emphasis in putting the interests of women during the pandemic and the new normal. We know that uh, in this pandemic, that women are in front line. We have, uh, we, uh, they are uh, as medical doctor, as a nurses, as a midwife, as a volunteers, there are many women there. And they left their family at home 
they leave the children at home, the parent at home, and uh, they are isolated. They cannot meet the children because they have to be isolated. So this is, uh, it's very difficult if we know that uh, we should make sure that uh, the interests of women during this pandemic are fulfilled. This is life, you know, social life of the family. They have the access to healthcare, the access to finance, and the, of course, the access to uh, do what they have, they can do. It's not only being a wife, it's not only being a woman, but being a human, of course. This is what we really need to do. This is the woman leader uh, can do during, uh, in their hand, I mean, that they, they can do it. Next, please. As the resilience of nation and government institution are challenged by COVID-19, we should ensure the policy to empower gender equality is in place. As we know that uh, now we have many women are sitting in the decision-making uh, position. I mean that we have in Indonesia, we have ministry, we have many of a good position for women, especially now we have a speaker, woman speaker. But we should not forget that uh, women have to help women. It's working with the men, yes. But then they should prioritize how to help women. Because if we do not do that, if we let women do themselves, then it will never happen. So we are here, the political leaders, women political leaders. We should remember when we have the chance, we have to take our friend, our sister to be with us, especially when you are having the good position. So now is the time for women political leaders to prioritize work in safeguarding gender equity and justice for the uh, during this uh, especially pandemic and new normal for our future generation as you know that uh, women we in the wpl i would i appreciate this really for your uh, initiative of having girl to leader this is a beautiful things because this is we should prepare our future generation for our uh, planet and good ways because as helen mentioned before that this is will continue to have but we should be ready we should be ready to get to face every challenge that we have not only men but women we should be ready for that once again thank you wpl for having this and thank you everybody for participating and i think that this is not only uh, this is the first time that i joined webinar which is only women but it's not only for women, of course, for everybody, because we are here for everybody. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nuriati, and also for putting up the uh, the slides, which uh, made those those points very uh, clear. Uh, I did see one message on the Q and A uh, where someone said that there was a bit of trouble with the live stream, uh, so. Uh, I hope that someone is monitoring that from uh, WPL. Uh, but it's now my pleasure uh, to bring in uh, the former chair of our board of uh, women political leaders and a former minister in Iceland and now a senior advisor uh, on women's leadership at UN Women in New York, uh, Hannah Berner Christians uh from uh, Iceland. And uh, Hannah is uh, going to be speaking, uh, well, around some of these issues we hope we'll be addressing in 2020, I guess. Uh, UN Women was all geared up for generation equality and two big meetings in Paris and Mexico City, which haven't been able to happen. Uh, but you, you also have uh, some thoughts and proposals, Hannah, around the, the role of the private sector in supporting uh, the women's leadership uh, agenda as well. So let's bring uh, Hannah in for her contribution and uh, let's hope that that live stream is, uh, is going well on YouTube. Hannah. Thank you so much, dear Helen, and thanks for the nice introduction. I'm so happy to be with you all and to see how many have been able to join us at this webinar from all over the world. It's super exciting. Of course, we should all have been in New York at this time, but often sort of things get in the way. And I think as Helen said in the beginning, and this is why 
I'm really not going to stay to any script on this. I think that has been what has been so amazing in these extraordinary times that we have been living and facing is that although it's of course been devastating in so many ways and our hearts goes out to everyone that has had to suffer and all the changes that people are experiencing and will continue to experience, we have still seen something that sort of reminds us that we can also be and we should aim to be positive. I mean, everything can happen. The streets of New York today doesn't, don't look anything like we thought they would look at this time and nobody would ever have believed that we have been faced with the challenges and the changes that we have been challenging with and, cha and the changes that we have experienced. In the same manner as, as Silvana said in the beginning, I mean, this also reminds us that everything can happen. I mean, we, we women have been told all our lives that things take time, that changes that we want and need to see in the world, not just for the benefit of women, but for the benefit of the whole world will take time. But I'm really beginning to be, because as Helen said, this 2020 was to be the year where gender equality was to be sort of not just talked about, but executed. UN Women, along with the whole UN family and with the whole of the world, was excited for the year, 25 years since Beijing, and we were going to change everything. And then we had the COVID, and then one sat down and said, will all change? I mean, will we go back years and decades because of gender equality, because of what we are seeing? I think we should, on the opposite, still try and make sure that this becomes the year we were hoping for. This year has been a harsh reminder of the need for female leadership, of the need for things to happen, of the need for women to be more sort of on in the forefront. We have also seen that the diversity and power that is needed is really important, not just when we talk about it, but actually when we execute it. So I think we should see this year as the opportunity to write the new normal. And let us also remember uh, what uh, our president Silvana said in the beginning. Uh, we shouldn't necessarily look back and say uh, that everything we had was so much precisely as we wanted it. If we just sort of reflect on the figures that we have been seeing and we as women political leaders so desperately want to change. I mean, we are still seeing a world where only 6% of heads of states are women where only 5% of the biggest of the CEOs of the biggest companies in the world are women, where only 25% of parliamentarians around the world are women. So we are still the seeing... Mr. Davis and on our terms. Not in Canada's... Where we are still seeing this humongous imbalance in power, and this is what we must change and will change. And we are still seeing, dear friends around the world, so uh, not only these figures that we find hard to change, we are still seeing the visions in our mind. There are researching, researches that show that if we ask all of us to for a brief second close our eyes and picture a leader in our minds, 80% of us, even us those on this call, will see a middle-aged white man. And this is what we need to change. We need to change the picture of a leader not just the ones that are on the states, but also in our minds. We need to see a diverse and balanced picture of, of people from around the world and both women and men. So this, I think, is so really, really important. I would also like uh, to mention what um, Helen mentioned in the brief introduction about the need for this conversation, not just to be amongst women that are in politics. I mean, this is women political leaders, we aim and strive to make sure that they have more power and that there are more of them, the number is higher, that's super important. But we also need to take that conversation more broadly into all sectors. Women need to be sort of writing the new normal by going across sectors. So this is why women political leaders have uh, in recent years had what we call Reykjavik Global Forum, where we invite women leaders from all over the world to join us here in Iceland uh, for, for a few days to make sure that we use, and we, the theme is always power together. We're trying to utilize our power together across continents, across, across countries, across sectors, from everywhere to make sure that we unite in one voice, saying that we want to change, we need to change, 
and that change cannot be executed in any shape or form and the new normal in building back to better cannot happen without women leaders being as vocal and as known if you like on the on the world states and in general so i think being mindful of time helen i'm seeing that you we wanted to start the conversation with all of these great women that are online i think i would call it a day for me here in in, in reykjavik iceland and just join you for a conversation thank you so much thank you so much uh, hannah and for stressing the importance of women leading and working across sectors. Of course, the political sector, the decision-making sector is very important, but, but so are all sectors to have women's input, participation, voices, uh, commitment. So we're going to come to the Q&A part of the meeting. And can I remind everyone who's, uh, who's joined us that down the bottom of your screen, you will see Q&A and you can post a question there. We're going to try and deal with as many as we can, and some have come in before. Um, there was an excellent question that I'm going to call up first that came from Somalia. Lucia, our support person at WPL, can you uh, read the question from Somalia? Sure, Chair. Yeah, uh, we have received a request from a question on behalf of the Ministry of Women and Human Rights Development of Somalia. Uh, and the question is, what are or can be strategies to increase women's participation in decision making about COVID-19 response and recovery? Are there examples from other countries? And a follow up questions, what are opportunities to use WPL to exchange experiences on a more regular basis, including through this time of COVID-19? So I'm going to allocate uh, questions to our panelists. And I wondered whether, Hannah, sitting as you do with your global role at w w UN Women, whether you would have some observations to make about what uh, UN Women is seeing with respect to how women are being included in uh, decision-making around COVID-19 and, and how UN Women perhaps will be advocating uh, for uh, women to take a prominent role in the reset which should follow COVID-19. Uh, Thank you so much, Helen. And um, I wish I could say that we were seeing this across borders and we were feeling and seeing that women were really sort of uh, getting uh, the, the power and the sort of influences we would be hoping. As Silvana mentioned in the beginning, the face of this pandemic has maybe been led when it comes to decision making way more in the picture of a man. But when we see the ones that are carrying the heavy burdens, as we have been mentioning, we're seeing the face of women. So I think we at UN Women, and I mean, I could say that I'm really, really sad because of this, but I'm also really hopeful because I think that the world is witnessing inequality maybe in a way that we haven't been sort of we haven't had it as much in our face as we have right now i think the the general public is having that fairly in its face we are seeing for example and we have been trying to do this within you and women we've been having roundtables we've been having leaders talks and all kinds of events and initiatives around making sure that the voices of women are heard uh, and I would also say that the plus thing about this is, for example, I'm fairly proud to be a member of the UN family right now because I think we are striving to make sure this is happening. I think we are focusing again and again on the importance of gender equality around all of this. But sadly, we are also in sort of the less fortunate sort of or, or, or some parts of the world where we are seeing inequality in a really, really immense and devastating way, if you like. You mentioned, Helen, I mean, the gender-based violence, the increase we are seeing there and, and in all shape or form regarding education of girls around the world and so on and so forth. But we're also seeing that when female leaders get the opportunity to really lead and to decide how we're doing things, we're seeing positive effects. I mean, we've all been seeing the news around the world where we are taking off female leaders and saying they've done it in an excellent way. Uh, so we're seeing pluses and minuses, but to be really super transparent and frank, 
we within UN Women feel that there is a lack of female voices around all of this. And we think that the sort of cry and call for more gender equality is higher than ever, if you like. Yes, so we're, we're recognizing the, you know, the truth that we, we wouldn't want to hear, but it's reality that women aren't as much to the fore as we would all like them to be, but that needs to strengthen our resolve to encourage women to step forward and encourage men to, to champion that uh, as well. Um, now, the next very interesting question that came in was from Kenya. Lucia, can you read the Kenya question? Uh, sure, uh, Chair. So, uh, Mary Senator, Member of Parliament from Kenya, uh, is putting forward a question. Countries with female leaders at the helm, such as Denmark, Norway, among others, have been recognized for their exemplary management of the COVID-19 pandemic. What lessons can we learn from these countries? on the management of the disease? And a follow-up questions, what role can female leaders play in ensuring that countries work together to reduce the possibility of another pandemic in the future? I'm going to call in Marie-Louise, the former president of Malta, to address that question based on her extensive leadership experience. Marie-Louise, Marie would you like to tackle that one? Yes. Um, um... And in fact, I actually did mention the fact that, or rather brought in the experience of, another, of a number of women leaders, such as the New Zealand um, Prime Minister, the, the Icelandic Prime Minister, and Germany. Um, a number, I, I, I actually mentioned them in my contribution that uh, the, the way they have tackled the, the pandemic is extremely commendable and that is evidence to me how uh, women leaders can be so effective. I also um, cited Professor Igli, um, a, a professor of psychology who has um, written uh, quite, a, quite a lot about this that uh, the, the uh, attributes or rather the abilities of women in terms of even their soft skills of empathy, compassion, are, are attributes that are very, very important components, one could say, for, for leadership and management. And I do believe that uh, we, I do believe that we have enough, enough um, evidence how much women can do and the ability that they have, and this is what is missing. We must, I, I, I'm, I am quite a direct person. Uh, Hannah has given a whole list of, the, of, of statistics of the inequalities that still uh, reign supreme with regards to women representation and, and the pub in public life and, and managing um, economic operations and etc. And that is what's missing. I mean, the old recipe, recipe, I call it the old recipe um, of having men there in, in numbers and, and everything. We must say it has, it has failed. So we really know what needs to be done. We, we, we need gender equality all through the hierarchy, one could say, of our society and leadership. We need more women to, to bring in the change, to have um, more more insight to, to things. I'm not saying that men do not have insight, but definitely women's perspectives are so important to be with men's perspective of how we look at things. And I have this conviction and sense of hope that with women, much more women, much more we, be, we need to be there in numbers. We can really change, the change bring in the change that is so needed for the global society for growth for the global society for for women and men for girls and boys across across the globe in we continue to um, perpetuate inequalities we come every so often as often as an international community many a time under the umbrella of of the united nations we commit ourselves to human rights our our forefathers committed themselves and for mothers committed themselves seven, over 70 years ago to bring equality, to bring as 
a sense of belonging, to bring human dignity to one and all. But then we fail. Then we come to, we have quite a number of instruments whereby the international um, community has agreed upon. The very latest one could say it was um, uh, the, five years ago, the, the, the sustainable development goals. But look at us today. We are still living in a world of so many inequalities. And what is lacking? What, 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 what has to be different? The difference has to be that more women are at the elm in leadership so that we can bring in the, these perspectives. We can bring in the holistic approach. We can be more compassionate and understand humanity and believe. And we have this belief, this inner belief. I have this experience of, as, as, as you all have, when we speak together, we, we, it's, I mean, you can see that we bring in these details. We can see through things. We can feel, we can understand um, society um, so, so, so well. So I do think that um, uh, uh, women leadership is so much needed for the necessary change. We need to take, um, uh, the, we need to look at the lessons learned from this very unprecedented period in the history of the world and do whatever we can to, so that that new normal that we're talking about post COVID-19 will usher in the, the, the necessary changes, the necessary changes for a sustainable way of life that, that gives true and effective dignity to one and all across the globe. Mm. Thank you, Marie-Louise, uh, for your, your passion and, and, and answering that. Uh, we have uh, another question that's come in. The African continent's been fantastic with questions. And uh, we have one from Rwanda. Uh, Lucia, could you read that question? Please? Yeah, correct. We have Pelagi Wera, Ms. Pelagi Wera, a member of the Senate of Rwanda, asking, um, to build in a new normal, we require new strategies. What kind of best strategies do you propose and do you think that it will work? Maybe we should be asking Rwanda, which has the highest proportion of female legislators in the world. <laughs> so what do they know that, the, that others don't? But Nur Hayati, I'd like to bring you in as a key panelist to uh, tackle uh, the question from the Senator from uh, Rwanda. Okay, thank you, Helen. I think that uh, I, I agree with the whole uh, panel is what uh, to answer this question. I think that what we really miss is the, we should uh, encourage ladies, women to uh, be very active, to take an initiative, to use the social media. So uh, to use the social media, because you know that you cannot expect that we know that in the street media, uh, strip mainstream, it's uh, quite difficult, you know, sometimes that it's only uh, what they need. I mean that we know that uh, all profit organization, but we are uh, WPL is non-profit organization, and women usually they uh, they took more initiative in doing a social work. But now we should really encourage women to use the social media so we can exchange. So we we know that's what's happening in the world because social media when uh, we use that uh, woman. Uh, help women i mean to make uh, when it's something happen with the woman so we can help them to make a viral so the world knows about this we know that we still need uh, uh, equality it's still uh, happening in everywhere discrimination especially this day when work from home that uh, i have one of friends who work from home but then they work from home up to 3 p.m in the morning and then how that they can manage the, uh, themselves. I mean that uh, the work from home, they have to be still healthy. I mean that the uh, hours, working hours has to be still there. Doesn't mean that work from home that they do not recognize the limit of time. This is what women uh, have to voice up. They have to use the social media, not only uh, depending on uh, media mainstreaming. So I really encourage all women, the strategy for us to eliminate the discrimination against women, uh, we should be together. Like we said that together we are uh, in power, we can do it. So we 
we should do that, Helen. And we have you, we are proud to have you. We are proud to have Silvana, Hannah, Mary Louise, you know, we have, well, we are here to be together to eliminate the discrimination against women, especially with our uh, sisters in Rwanda, in Somalia. Let's use um, social media. It's not for only the millennial. Now they use the word millennial, but we are women, uh, we are the millennial also. We have many uh, girls to lead also. So this is what I uh, suggest. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nuriati. Now we have some wonderful questions coming in online. Uh, just before I come uh, to those, uh, could I ask uh, Lucia to play the very short video from Rosalia Atiaga, who was president of Ecuador in 1997, and Rosalia serves on our board. It, it's pretty early in the morning in Ecuador, so she wasn't able to join live, but she has sent a few words. Lucia, are you ready to roll that video now? Yes, one second. One second. classes modern that are online classes. We have to work a lot on uh, uh, improve the quality of teaching uh, online. Uh, the other big issue is uh, the lack of tutors uh, in terms of how rural areas can be part of this digital education if they don't have computers or they don't have also a connection. This is the other big issue like mine, Ecuador and most of countries of Latin America, the problem with the computers and the connection is a big issue uh, because uh, also if a family have a computer, what's happening with teleworking of parents and if they are two or three kids, how they can use at the same time the only computer that is at home. Uh, I think uh, we have to learn to work a lot governments and the NGOs and the local authorities also uh, try to make it in a better way to put uh, computers all over the different uh, houses, uh, especially in rural areas and also in, in uh, houses that people doesn't have uh, the economy to support this and also the connection. But um, in, in our country, in countries like Ecuador, we have another that is uh, what's happening with the use of uh, jobs. People is not in jobs, and uh, they are trying to uh, prepare for food and education. And um, the situation of women is uh, really bad because the uh, parents prepare sometimes that the kids, the boys, go to school and the girls. Um, the desertion schools is a big problem also for the uh, families uh, that are in the situation. Um, I, I try to do this in my country and maybe in other countries by uh, capacity building of teachers and also try to get this, to give the support uh, for families. Thank you. I think that's the uh, the end of the video, and I apologise. The sound quality wasn't very good. I, I had some difficulty uh, hearing it uh, in in New Zealand. But look, wonderful questions coming in. So many. Uh, one I'm going to take first. Mary Gerty, who says, "I'm afraid that when women will be working from home more, this will or might hinder their career prospects, as they are never, almost almost never." in their place of work. I fear that this will result in a backward step uh, for women. So I think Mary's probably referring to the fact that when you're out of sight, you can also be out of mind, which, which obviously is, is an issue. Another thing which um, 
a young woman uh, with family uh, at home have mentioned to me you're trying to work, you've got little children around, the baby's demanding to be fed, uh, the toddler is um, throwing things out the window. Uh, and uh, it, it does remind us that, that women who go to work in the formal economy, or indeed the informal economy, they, they need support with, with childcare. So I think in response to Mary's questions, I think there are a number of issues uh, about uh, remote working uh, for women, which, uh, which need to be addressed uh, seriously uh, going forward. So uh, thank you for that. Now, let me um, now come to some of the, uh, the other uh, issues. Uh, Lila uh, from uh, Monaco and Morocco says, how could we get in touch and exchange on a more regular basis so that this meeting could become a discussion in the long run? Well, I think that's that's something very much like women political leaders to Obviously, it has been uh, promoted quite heavily on, on social media, but of course, to have social media, you have to have connectivity. And we also recognize that there is a, a gender gap in connectivity. Uh, I have been involved before in a global commission on broadband access and uh, on the gender inequities in broadband access. So that, again, tells us that as we shape a, a new future, uh, broadband connectivity is going to be incredibly important. Now I've got a question from Azur. I'm back. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how from your perspective at, at UN Women advocating for women across all contexts, would you like to make any observations on how uh, women who are displaced, internally displaced or as migrants, uh, can be supported. I'm so sorry, Helen, but we lost you, so I didn't hear the question. I sort of okay. just heard, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so the question is on the Q&A, mm -hmm. and it's from uh, Azerbaijan, and the question refers to uh, within already vulnerable displaced communities, refugees and IDPs, women and girls? We, uh, I'm, try, I'm trying, Helen, because we lost you again. I'm thinking, can we put the question in the chat box so we can it, see? It, yeah, the question is in the Q&A. If you go into the Q&A function. Yeah, because Helen, uh, there is something with your connection. So you're in and out. Mm. Maybe it's the same for me. I don't know if it's the, it's the general thing. Uh, so maybe Lucia can put it in the in the chat box. Yeah. Um, yes, it's there. It's it's there now. Um, 
And maybe let me type to Hannah. Thank you. But maybe if somebody yeah, else heard it, they can come in if they heard the uh, the. Are you hearing me now, Hannah? Yes, I am. Your your connection yeah. is way better now. Thank you, Helen. Okay, so can you comment on the particular needs of women in humanitarian settings, women Absolutely. who are refugees and displaced? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And this is, of course, such an uh, important issue, Helen, that you, you might be more familiar from your former work as well. I mean, the devastating thing about all of these, uh, dear friends, the situation that we're facing now is that we seem to be seeing in in a bad form, actually, that this is hitting the ones that we don't want this to hit hard, way harder than us. I mean, we can sit here all from across the world in front of our computer uh, talking about the issues, but we have the connection, we have the homes and we have the family around us and so on and so forth. The ones that are facing more horror, if you like, we are worried that that will become even worse. We are seeing, and I don't know if you saw the prospects, for example, from the World Bank yesterday or the day before, is that all of these groups that you were mentioning that we have been trying to protect will be hit way harder than the rest of us. And that's the sad issue around all of this. So many of the things that we have been working around to make sure that we do better, that is the global community when it comes to these women, will be hit hard. So I think not only is there a need talent for us to sort of review what has been working and what we were aiming to do, but I think we need to do better. I think we need to put an extra emphasis on all of this. And I think if we are, we are worried about the future and somebody mentioned in the chat box earlier, I mean, is there a possibility? And this is what we're faced with everywhere, even in Iceland, where we are so fortunate in so many ways. Will this hit us harder in some shape or form? I mean, will this be, uh, come uh, sort of uh, a deeper pandemic in, in some ways? And I think the worry here is that in views and sort of the tolerance of people towards inequality, this is what we're seeing in the States today. This is what we're seeing around the world because racism isn't just a thing for the US of A, it's a thing for all of us. And I think that in these times, we are seeing that we will be not only hit harder, but it will sort of damage more, sort of the inequality will be more visual, if you like. And this is why I'm being frank here in saying that I'm really, really worried about the groups that you were mentioning and how we are going to tackle that and make sure that we don't throw the success in some shapes that we've had way back in decades and years. This is why I'm I'm, I'm, I'm being really, really worried about this part. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry for being so honest about that. I just think it's what we're faced with. One organization I'm involved with uh, called Women Deliver uh, has been focusing on advocacy around getting more of the humanitarian response dollar for people and refugees and internally displaced uh, mm. uh, situations more of that dollar going to women. Because when you analyze how much of humanitarian response funding goes to women, it's pathetic. It's a tiny, tiny proportion. And, you know, I guess the answer will be, oh, well, it's mainstream. Well, unfortunately, mainstream often doesn't produce relevant programming to meet uh, women's needs. So I think advocacy for that is, is very important. I have a very nice question here from Dr. Nadia Arop, Minister of Culture, Museum and Heritage from South Sudan. And the minister asks, what role could women leaders play to raise up the women in rural areas to take part in legislation or decision making uh, since uh, their participation is so vital? Uh, Nuriati uh, of Indonesia, you come from a country with a in a very large and dispersed rural population. Is that a question you would like to uh, tackle? Okay, thank you, uh, Helen. You are right, you know that uh, we, as uh, you know that we are a huge uh, country with uh, six, more than 16,000 island and its uh, population. Then uh, I think that uh, this is a very important question. 
and uh, thank you for yeah, student questions. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yes. So I think that in this uh, time, what the, we really need. Uh, Helen, sorry, can you uh, repeat the? Just the question itself, sorry. Uh, yeah, the, the question is, in essence, how can we make sure that the women in the rural areas are included uh, in the decision making going forward? How can they participate? Okay. okay, because as I mentioned before in my presentation, that we here we had we do have, uh, you know, that within quota and not quota is still be, be, being a discussion. But I think what it's need to be uh, done it's uh, for. Uh, developing country, uh, uh, we need to have a quota because without quota, we cannot push a woman to be in the, the decision making. We are lucky in Indonesia, we have 30% quota. Now we have a mayor in, uh, woman as a mayor, we have woman as a governor. So I think that the legislation that sh we should uh, really uh, put a quota to women. And in the rural area, we do have uh, uh, I have a, a lot of friends in the rural area as a medical doctor, of course. They are also women. So we, we support them as a, a, a sitting in the political uh, uh, party. I support them to run for the uh, decision making. I mean, for as a mayor, as the governor. We should do that because without uh, our involvement, uh, that women are not uh, having the chance. I mean, because if they have to uh, compete with the men, uh, you know, in the all the decision making that we need to um, uh, finance. That's that's why the most important that we sh we should uh, help women, support women to have access to finance. I'm I proposing at that time to I I keep saying this in OECD with the World Bank with the IMF. I said that with all the bankers also, please provide uh, loan for the women who are running in the. Uh, as a mayor, you know that uh, they can, women are good; they will pay. But this is should be access to finance has to give to the woman, especially when they run to the election. It's difficult for women who has no finance to sit in the decision making policy. This is what's the most important. That's why uh, I really wish that uh, this Women Political Leaders uh, Global Forum are. Uh, we have Hannah, we have uh, Silvana, we have you and Mary, Helen, that we always has to influence the bankers, especially at this uh, pandemic, you know, that uh, women, the men lose their job, the job uh, homeless people, and then that uh, they should do something for not only women, for everybody, with the, for instance, that uh, when they have deposit, there should be no, uh, no panel, Panel, no uh, penalty for the when they want to uh, withdraw the deposit, and then to, uh, also the loan they, they should do this because women need finance, and the most important for women are uh, access to finance. This is what my uh, ex their own experience, and you know that women should work three times than the men to be able to recognize. So this is uh, we should not do this anymore. We should work together and uh, hand in hand to let women sit in the decision-making policy. Thank you. Thank you, Nurayati. Now we've been joined by another of our board members of World Political Leaders, and she is Her Excellency Jewel Howard Taylor, the Vice President of Liberia and President of the Senate of Liberia. And I'd like to bring uh, you in now, Jewel, uh, if you're able to, uh, to uh, make the contribution you were going to make to us. So we're all ears to you, uh, I guess, in Monrovia, Liberia. And thank you for this opportunity. I'm sorry I was a little late. I was a little confused about what was happening at what time. And But I wanted to say again, thank you for coming up with this topic. What do we do as leaders to ensure that women are elected? Um, I've had the opportunity to be a part of an electoral process more than three times. And from what I can put on the table this morning as the most important thing is not just financing. Financing is an issue. But if women make up more than 50% of the voting population in most countries, 
why aren't women electing women leaders? And I think that is the crux of it. Because you could have all of the funding and the women in your constituency or in your local government could decide they will support a man as opposed to supporting a woman candidate. And I think that is the bottom of where we are. How can we get women to understand that when you have even just one voice in a position of trust and leadership, it changes the entire scope of what happens. And Madam Helen Clark will tell you that from her leadership uh, as Prime Minister of New Zealand, that just being a female at the top shifted a lot of things that needed to be shifted. So as we talk about financing, I don't know if there will be any bank or any micro um, credit organization that will give money to women to go and, and, and get elected because they don't know whether we're gonna get elected or not. And then if you don't get elected, how do you pay that funding back? So I think we need to backtrack a little bit. Here in Liberia, we've tried over the past 14, 15 years, even when Madam Salif was president, to get the quota um, bill passed. We sent it through the legislature more than five times. And in the end, the men is a purely male, 99% male dominated legislature said, wait until we do the constitutional review and we'll find a way to put what you, what the women want in the constitution. So it doesn't become just an arbitrary law that can be, you know, re reversed. And we agreed to wait. And when the constitutional review process ensued about a year ago, everything was trashed out of the legislature on the streets into the dustbin. And I think that was my saddest moment as a, not just a vice president, but a female um, politician. But we've lost seats in the legislature. And so we don't have the point where women can actually come together as members of the legislature and push anything that's important for women. So I think as we look at the new normal, as we look at what's happening across our own world, as we look at the fact that women leadership actually at the highest level does bring the changes that we would like to see, our question is how do we get women elected? And I think we must begin at the feet of every woman. What does she understand a woman who is elected? What is the role of that woman who gets elected? What are the changes that she brings to bear if she has um, a, a leverage that allows her to make the final decisions. There are women in the second and the third tier levels, but they're not the final decision makers. And so you can talk, you can, you know, do all of what you would like to do and you can make the noise. In the end, the final decisions are made by the male uh, members of our governance systems. In the end, they do what they like to do. So we're still at the back burner. We must find a way to begin to talk to women. Maybe we need to do a she for she campaign. How do we get out the message of how important just one person is and why should women coalesce around other women uh, so that we get more women elected in the places where it matters, whether it's at the presidency, whether it's at the legislature, whether it's getting women in the judiciary so that the laws can change to reflect our views and, and our values and what we would like to see. We must go back to that she for she can't, I mean, she for she campaign, if it's possible to put such a campaign together so that all of us can go back to the bottom of the barrel and begin to talk to each woman in all of the space that we operate in so that they can change their minds and realize that we are an asset to them. But that asset needs support. That asset needs to be elected when the time comes. That asset needs to be functional in a way where changes can actually take place. And the most important place is at the presidency, but also at the legislature, because that's where the laws that protect, the laws that provide, the laws that ensure our rights are, are, are adhered to are done. And so it's not just all about financing. It's also about the framework of our women, as you find in different spheres, whether you're in, on the African continent, where women still feel they don't have a voice, or where you're at the United States, where women do have a voice, but then they still haven't managed to elect a female president. So it's a very tall order, but I think we must keep marching on, we must keep moving, we must keep working, but then where there are gaps, let's look at where those gaps are and see how we can actually fill in the gaps that will help us actually push the issues that we're talking about. 
in COVID-19, you, you can only imagine that women are again being are marginalized. They're not able to get out, especially at the lower levels, to seek food uh, or, or whatever needs are for the families. A lot of female heads of households exist across our spheres, and women are now responsible to take care of children. They're on a lockdown in most places. How are those families even surviving? What, how do we get to them? It's not about sending a meal, you know, every once in a while. It's about empowering them so that in instances where there is a shock to the, to the full system, uh, then they have some savings or they have something that they can do to allow them to earn some income so that they're able to sustain their families. So I think, you know, at the first uh, intervention, these are my initial thoughts. Mm. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Vice President of, of, uh, of Liberia for you know, those, those many very constructive ideas and great to have you uh, on the uh, symposium summit tonight. I know that we're about three minutes away from the, the time for ending uh, this event. Uh, have some lovely questions there and, and one uh, suggestion I would like to make is that if we haven't got to your question, please send it to us uh, via uh, social media. I'm on Facebook, uh, Twitter at Helen Clark NZ, Instagram. Uh, so are others of our, our speakers. So please feel free to message us and we'll do our best to respond. Uh, there was one that came in from uh, Sweden, which looked at the broader uh, environmental issues uh, that are so pressing at the moment. And of course, you know, one of the issues that's been talked about a lot is the issue of the illegal wildlife trade and how when illegal wildlife are, are, are trafficked and end up in, in markets for human consumption, that in itself can be a vector uh, for the spread of these animal to human uh, transmission zoonotic uh, diseases. So our questioner asked, and it's a long question that's uh, on the Q&A screen, uh, whether women leaders might be uh, prepared to take the lead in supporting and initiating an international ecocide law. So I just put that on the, the table for our women leaders to consider, although we don't have time to answer it in full tonight. Uh, what, what I would say uh, is that we do need to look at the issues now holistically because we have these simultaneous crises. The biodiversity crisis is one, climate change another, and talked about the others, the health crisis with the pandemic, the inequality uh, uh, crisis, the, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so having women's perspectives across these issues is absolutely critical. And while we rightly focus a lot on the social protection and the health and the education, which is so critical, uh, I want to see women's voices uh, on, on all the issues. So thank you uh, to the Swedish participant for uh, raising the, uh, the great importance of, of that. Uh, so uh, I'm also told that questions can be sent uh, to uh, WPL Global Webinar uh, at uh, wpleaders.org. That, that's too much probably for people to remember, but uh, go into uh, the Women Political Leaders uh, website, there'll be a contact function there and the questions can uh, also be sent uh, there. Uh, so with those words and noting uh, the questions have come in from everywhere, some great ones from New Zealand, from Montenegro, from uh, another one from Liberia as well, we, we can't deal with them in the, in the time that we have now, but thank you to everyone. The recording is going to be available. It will be posted on social media for women political leaders. And that's probably where most of you heard about the uh, event. Uh, so the full recording of the event will be available. And I repeat again, we're very happy to answer the questions if you can get them uh, through uh, to us. The recording will be available on the Women Political Leaders website, also on YouTube, uh, and on some, S-O-M, capital Z, social media, social media, <laughs> trying to uh, decode the acronyms here. 
Um, thank you, panelists, for making time to come in from around the world, from Liberia to Malta to uh, Indonesia to Hannah sitting in Reykjavik and our women political leaders uh, team, uh, mainly sitting in Brussels and in, in Belgium at the, the heart of the European Union. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, participating and, and making today a, a, a very, very interesting uh, digital summit which I'm going to thank you all again and wish everyone a good night or a good day uh, wherever uh, you are at the present time. Thank you and over and out. Thank you.